I'm here at Chalk Valley History Festival with Ben Goldsmith, author, financier, and a leading light in the rewilding movement. Ben, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me, Zach. Um, I'd love to start with your book, God is an Octopus. Um, and in it, you talk about how nature became a real sense of hope and meaning for you after suffering a great loss. What was it about nature that, that led you there? Yeah, when, when something really bad happens to you, in my case, I lost my daughter, you become instantly engulfed in a kind of darkness, yes. you know, which is um, really stifling and really hard to kind of cope with, really hard to survive, kind of minute to minute. And, and what you find is that shards of light start to penetrate that darkness. That's kind of the process of survival. And it might be a nice cup of tea on a sunny morning sitting with your wife, in my case. And what I found is more often than not, the shards of light that penetrated the darkness, in my case, were in some way associated with nature. Sure. So we have a pond on the bend of a river in my place in Somerset, and I took to swimming in there. And it just felt good. You know, it, so I was sort of surprised that it felt good, but it did. And I would go swimming there about 10 times a day, and, and, and it would just make me feel better. Mm. And, um, and then beavers moved into the valley along the bottom of our farm. Oh, and, and for the first time, I sort of felt a flicker of kind of joy and excitement, mm. searching for signs of those beavers along our watercourse. And I think nature has a very powerful um, kind of healing Thing about it you know i think we're, we're, we're intricately connected with nature in ways that we really don't understand and that's why it makes us feel better yeah um, absolutely absolutely and you've been a a pioneer in uh, your support for rewilding which is you know bringing more nature to those who might not have ready access to it why do you think it's so important that everyone gets a chance to to interact with nature I think, I think it's one of the great iniquities of our country is that loads of people just don't have access to nature. Mm. And that's partly because they just don't, because it's difficult to reach kind of open spaces. And it's partly because we just don't have that much nature left in this country. You, know, you kind of fly into Gatwick, you know, or Heathrow, and you see this great patchwork quilt of little green fields and so on. And most people don't realize that the color has somehow been drained of that landscape. Mm. And the bird song has really fallen silent in great swathes of our country. So the answer is to restore nature while giving people more access to it. Mm. I think the lockdowns of 2020, 2021 really highlighted that there is a divide in this country between those who are either rural or rich and who can walk out of their back door and find some nature and those who aren't and just don't even know it's there, let alone having access to it. So I, I chaired this thing called the Rewilding London Task Force. And the idea is that we really can weave wild nature back through the fabric of our cities. You know, it doesn't need to be just something that exists away from where people live. You know, we can have threads and, 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 and patches of nature right in the middle of our busiest cities. And the Rewilding London Task Force is doing some really cool stuff. You know, we're looking at bringing back white-tailed eagles in the Thames estuary oh, and, and 650 acres of flat roofs on warehouses and things in East London. We're going to do rubble roofs where you scatter rubble and topsoil and some seeds and you get these self-sustaining wildflower meadows wow. across great swathes of our flat rooftops and we're creating pocket rewilding patches of scrub and deadwood and new reed areas and even beaver enclosures in our in our royal parks wow. so I, I we've got to bring nature to people and we've also got to allow people access to nature i think it's key to solving a whole bunch of kind of individual and societal issues is just reconnecting people with nature mm. no, that is fantastic and in many ways rewilding is restoring a place to its historical state right how much does the natural history of a place come to play uh, when you go about that rewilding so, process? So I put it slightly differently. I think it's about restoring natural processes and you don't sure. really know what state you're going to end up with. You know, the, the thing that we're starting to understand more and more is that the natural fabric of the world is alive. Mm. In other words, it's kind of collectively alive in a way that we haven't never really understood. You know, the mystery is way bigger than anything we understand in science, but who'd, who'd have thought you know, 10 years ago that trees in a forest talk to each other by way of a great kind of wood wide web under the soil made up of micro rizal fungal networks and not they don't just talk to each other they they share nutrients and food with each other and, and who'd have thought that perhaps the trees themselves aren't in charge of this that actually the network itself is making the decisions yeah. the whole thing is alive and it's vastly mysterious and we have no idea you know how it all works mm. but we're starting to understand certain important keystone processes for example we know that beavers which are a keystone species hold water in the landscape so mm. put them back and you'll get new wetlands that just abound with life no we know that 
uh, wild cattle, aurochs and wild bison and even domestic longhorn cattle are vital in kind of beating up and browsing and grazing and trampling and kind of creating these amazing shape-shifting kind of mosaic woodlands which are bound with life in a way that woodlands without cattle don't. So if we can put back some of those processes, we don't really know what will happen, but we just know it'll be magical. Mm. So I think that's what rewilding is, is trying to restore natural processes to the extent we can. And obviously you can do more you know, in the wilds of Scotland than you can here in the Chalk Valley. Sure. And here in the Chalk Valley, you can do more than you can in Regent's Park. But we can do something in each of these places to move places along the spectrum, yeah. if you see what I mean. Absolutely, absolutely. And one of the things that you mentioned in your talk that you gave here, um, and something that you touched on there, I think, as well, is um, almost stepping back to historical ways of farming, those traditional ways of, of having the cattle involved in the farming yep. methods. Can you explain a little bit more about that? What might that look like? So I think in really good land, the land that pretty much produces all the food, the land in the east, for example, Cambridgeshire, Lincolnshire, I think we want to combine the best of ancient wisdom. So things like rotational practices, you know, you grow your wheat and then you put your sheep on and then you grow your potatoes and then pigs and you have these kind of rotational practices with the best of modern technology. So things like drones and soil sensors that can reduce the amount of chemicals you have to use. You know, if you had, if I had a bit of eczema on my arm, I wouldn't soak my entire body in steroids every week. I might just precision apply it. Yeah. So in the good land, I think we want to combine modern technology with ancient wisdom. On our less productive landscapes, and particularly our national parks, places like Dartmoor, Bodmin, you know, the Lake District, in these places, I think we can, we can have natural processes, but in which the participants are domestic livestock, longhorn cattle, for example. Sure. And so we get the same kind of outcomes as if we were to reintroduce wild oryx, mm. but we still get farmers, we still get farming, we're still producing a bit of beef, just less of it. Yeah. So I think a gentler, way of farming in our national parks which sort of mimic natural processes is a way that we restore nature whilst keeping farmers in place mm. um, and i'm hoping that the new subsidy regime will, will will do that it's not quite generous enough they need to put more money in it mm. but i think um i think it's the move in the right direction yeah so as a very brief final question how have you found chalk valley history festival and what's been the response to to your ideas and your your talk yeah, I, I'm, I'm so happy to be here. It's amazing. I want to come back again and again. I want to bring my kids here to see all this oh, we would love historical to army equipment. And um, I've been blown away that there were so many people that came to hear me talk and they didn't throw eggs at me. So um, I think <laughs> it, may have, it may have gone all right. Um, I recently said we've got to get sheep out of our national parks. And I know there's a few sheep around here and sheep farmers. So I thought maybe that might be a subject for debate. <laughs> um, but thank you so much for having me, Zach. No, thank you. I very much appreciate your time. Really appreciate to um, talking thank to you, you as well. Thank you. Thank you.